Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It's Monday morning, June 26th, 2023. Hope everybody's doing all right today. Morning, Lyle. Good to see you. Good morning, Janie. Good to see you. Others who are joining on the stream here on the church page, but then also on the nearchurches.com Facebook page. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, you can use the comment section on either one of those pages, and I will acknowledge them when I see them. Good morning, Sheila. Good to see you. I'll just go ahead and tell you, this will be the only stream for this week. And then next week, we're going on vacation, and we're leaving the end of this week. And So anyway, this will be the only stream for this week, and none for next week, so I guess two weeks from today, we'll come back to live streaming at 11. Anyway, a little while back, let me, let me look at this real quick. I did some videos on... Uh, various questions. I've got some questions about divorce. It's actually what I'm looking at here, just quickly. Uh, so about two weeks ago, I was looking on our YouTube channel. A question about divorce. I did a looks like a 43 minute video on that day. Well, I had some follow up questions, and I actually got a phone call the other day from an individual who had seen the. Um, that live stream that I did on divorce, and they had a question for me. I don't know this person personally, somehow, I guess I guess from the internet. They got the number to the church building here. They called me up, and, and uh, we, we talked for about an hour and a half, and they had some questions and about a lot of different things. And uh, we agreed on most everything. We looked at the Bible and talked about various things, but then this question came up about divorce, and he wanted to go a little bit deeper. Um, and the question is, that we're going to answer today uh, that he brought up to me is are non-Christians, are they subject to Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 19 on divorce and remarriage? And the argumentation kind of went along the lines. Of, this individual did not believe that, does not believe that non-Christians are subject to Matthew chapter 19. Um, those, so I started doing a little digging just to see like positions that people actually take in regard to this. And there are actually people who say that before you become a Christian, you can get married and divorced and remarried as many times as you want. And then if you become a Christian, that's the point in time at which you become um, amenable or subject to the law of Christ on divorce and remarriage. And whatever marriage you're in, at that current time, you have to stay in that marriage. So that's the question we need to answer. Are Christians, or we could, I guess we could ask it this way. Is Matthew 19, 9 for Christians only? Uh, some people refer to it, if you do a little Googling on, uh, on the internet about this, they'll refer to Matthew 19 as a covenant passage. And what that means is, well, Jesus did all of this teaching, but his covenant didn't come into effect until Acts chapter 2. And that's true. You know, it's, it's Hebrews 9, verses 16 and 17 tells us that it's with the death of the one who wrote the will that his will comes into effect. All right, a will, of his, a will is of no force while the person's still alive. Absolutely true. Um, of course, we, we look at the day of Pentecost there in Acts chapter 2 as the, uh, as the beginning of the kingdom, uh, the, the inception, if you will, of the new covenant. But the position on, on this question of are non-Christians subject to divorce and remarriage, the position is, well, yes, this is what Jesus said, but people don't become subject to it until they become Christians. And those are two different, two different issues, you might say. When did Jesus' law come into effect? Well, the, the establishment of the church, Acts chapter 2, after his death, obviously. That's one thing. But to say then that, well, non-Christians are not subject to his law until they become Christians, that's a wholly different subject. So think about it this way. If non-Christians are not subject to the law of Christ until they become Christians, 
then why should they become Christians? That's a, that's a question that I would need answered adequately, because if you're not subject to it, you're not subject to it, so why then become a Christian? You can literally live any way you want with no consequence if, you, if you're not subject to His law. I mean, that's the whole point of um, where there is no law, there is no sin. If a non-Christian's not subject to it, then what are they subject to? Anyway, so let's get into this. So I guess what I want to deal with, first of all, is the authority of Jesus, okay? And so here's another question I have. If that is the case, why is it only Matthew 19, 9 that people want to talk about in this particular regard? Why not all these other statements that Jesus made and these other laws, if you want to use that term, that Jesus lays out in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? But let's start here with talking about the authority of Jesus. I'm in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Now listen, this is after his death, burial, and resurrection, but it's before his ascension and before the establishment of the church. It's before the inauguration of the kingdom. And yet he still says, all authority has been given unto me, given to me in heaven and on earth. So who is left out of that? And, and more specifically, which part of his teaching is left out of that? Are there individuals that he does not have authority over, either in heaven or on earth? Or does he only have that authority in heaven and on earth when somebody becomes a Christian? What happens a lot of time, and in particular with the subject of divorce and remarriage, is it gets personal. And you will see things, and this has happened to um, what you might call big-named preachers over the years, is they will have a stance on divorce and remarriage. And then a daughter or a son, or perhaps themselves, will get in a scenario that they hadn't really thought through, and then they'll change their view on divorce and remarriage to justify a relationship of someone close to them. It's happened many times uh, to, to quote-unquote big-name preachers. Well, that would be pretty convenient if you could change your views based on how someone you loved is living, but that's not how Scripture works. That's not how authority works. So Jesus either has all authority in heaven and on earth, or he does not. And if he does, why is it then that only Matthew 19, 9 is singled out in saying, well, that's only for Christians? You could do that with literally everything else Jesus said, if that were how it, was, if that were how it worked which it is not. All right, so here's another passage to think about in terms, just broad scope here, all right, in terms of Jesus' Jesus's authority. John 17, 2, As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Okay, look at that. He has authority over all flesh. Well, does that mean, does that only mean that Jesus has authority over people once they become Christians in the realm of divorce and remarriage? And again, why is it that one subject that's singled out from all the subjects that Jesus addressed, from all the laws that Jesus stated, why is it that one that we want to say, well, it doesn't apply to non-Christians, only to Christians? Jesus either has all authority in heaven and on earth and all authority, or authority over all flesh, or he does not. There's no third option here, all right? Um, another verse, I'll just actually click backwards here. I'm going to go back to John chapter 12, the end of John chapter 12, down to verse 48. Here we go, John 12, 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words. Well, which words, Jesus? Would these be all the words that you spoke? Does this exclude divorce and remarriage? Because that's what a lot of folks want. Has that which judges him. The words that I have spoken, or the word that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father told me, so I speak. So again, all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. Authority over all flesh, John 17, 2. Whoever does not receive his words, whoever rejects him and does not receive his words will be judged by those words anyway. 
Now, is that all people or not? Is that Christians only? Is this Would this apply to people who are not Christians when Jesus comes in judgment? I mean, you have to... You have to understand not just what you're saying, but the implications of what you're saying. And to say that Jesus' law on marriage and divorce and remarriage only applies to Christians, it negates these passages that we've already looked at, that he has all authority, all authority over all flesh, that his word will be the standard of judgment. You have to understand the implications of what you're saying. To say that Jesus on divorce only applies to Christians limits his authority and limits the the scope of his judgment. Um, another verse, John chapter 5 and verse 22, the Father has committed all judgment unto the Son. Well, is that all judgment of both believers and non-believers or not? Is that all judgment in terms of all things or is divorce and remarriage left out of that equation? It's very convenient to hold a position like that. Um, I mean, it sounds... How would you say it? It sounds comforting. That one of the hardest subjects to deal with, and I've dealt with it everywhere I've ever been as a as a preacher, is divorce. And re, and and I would say, I guess more specifically, remarriage. It's everywhere. There's no question about it. Uh, I would say everybody, every person who is a Christian, is either directly or indirectly has been impacted by divorce. Congregations, um, families, it's, it's just like a universal issue. And the subject matter is very clear. Okay, Scripture is very clear on this. Now, what happens a lot of times is people will try to pit verse against verse. They'll talk about Matthew 19. Well, Jesus was talking to Jews, and that only applies to Christians. But then when you get over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says that Christians aren't under bondage to that law anymore. And they'll try to make Paul say something contrary to what Jesus said. Or to, they, they wouldn't say contrary. They would say something like a mitigation. Okay, well, here's, an, here's another exception that Paul gives that Jesus didn't give. I don't even know if we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 today unless somebody has a question about it. But um, I'm addressing something very specific that was sent to me. Um, another verse that I want us to look at, hey, uh, Connie, good to see you. Another verse I want to look at, again, just broad scope, considering the authority of Jesus, is in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 19. And it is verse 16. It's talking about Jesus. Uh, he'll rule rule the nations, by the way. He's talking about Jesus' universal reign. He's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Uh, he'll tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Okay, that's judgment language all nations, and he has on his robe and his right and, and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is a passage, again, that addresses the universality of the authority of Jesus Christ. It's not limited. His authority is in no way limited. It's not all people, but then only Christians when it comes to this particular question. Um, his sayings don't have any authority there. Think about the ridiculousness of that position. He has all authority except over non-Christians when they get divorced and remarried. That's the exception. So that kind of shows me a motivation. Instead of dealing with the hard issues and, and standing where Scripture stands, too many people are willing to compromise. Um, anyway, so the question then being, well, when did his law come into effect? We've already touched on that. Acts chapter 2, the Gospels preached, the church is established and you have his law enacted. Again, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17 talk about that. Man, how many, how many passages could we address that deal with the, the universal nature of the authority of Christ? Okay, Acts chapter 17, just another, yet another passage talking about this. The times of these ignorance God overlooked, but now command, commands all men everywhere to repent. Well, why is that the case? Because there's coming a day in which he will judge, notice this, the world. All right? So all men everywhere to repent because he's going to judge the world. Nobody, how do you say this? This is going to be a double negative. Nobody is not subject to Christ. 
Everybody is subject to the law of Christ. There's no exception. All right? Everybody's going to answer to him. And, and you look right here, in fact, just earlier in Acts 17, that this is what God's desire is. He's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. He's determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Notice verse 27. Why did he do that? So that they should seek the Lord. Now he's talking about non-believers here. What are they to be doing? They should seek the Lord, that they might grope for Him. Grope, it's, it's the idea of to feel for something, to try to find something. You're putting in effort to find something and find Him, though He's not very far from each one of us. Well, He's not, because He's given us His Word. But again, you notice here, this is God's desire. You've got to seek Him. Well, you've got to seek Him on His terms, too. That, that stands to reason. Uh Okay, so here's another question. Connie says, One elder says that when a couple living in adultery and then repent are forgiven, but they can keep living as man and wife. I wholeheartedly disagree. Yes, that's a completely untenable position. Okay, untenable. That is indefensible. Okay, so what is repentance? Uh, repentance is a change of mind. i tell you what, um, we're in the book of Acts. Let's look at this concept of repentance real quick. Uh, Acts chapter 26 and it's when Paul is preaching to Agrippa. Let's see here. Acts 26, 19. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. This is when he was called by Jesus to become a, um, an apostle. But declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea. And then to the Gentiles, look, that they should repent. Repentance is something that happens in the mind. The Greek word literally means a change of mind. Okay? So, listen to what Connie just said. When a couple is living in adultery, they are to repent, and then they can keep living in that state. Acts 26, 20. That they should repent and turn to God, third, and do works befitting repentance. You can't stay in that relationship. If Scripture identifies a marriage as adulterous, and that, and that can happen, you can't repent, you can't change your mind about adultery, and then keep on living in adultery. That, that, makes, complete, that, that it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Well, how can you say that? Let me show you another passage here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. An adulterer is not going to go to heaven. Well, what is an adulterer? We may go look at that here in just a minute. But notice what he says here in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you. But what happened? You were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So is it possible to be in an adulterous relationship and to repent of that and stay in it. Think about that question. Can you be in adultery, repent, and stay in that same relationship? The only answer to that question is no. Because repentance occurs in the mind. It's a change of mind, but it always has to be followed by works, Acts 26, 20, works that are befitting or works that demonstrate repentance. You cannot stay in that same relationship. And we could illustrate that any number of ways. I guess one of the classic illustrations. You've probably heard this. I've heard this many times. You're a thief before you become a Christian. You've stolen all of this stuff and you have it in your possession. You're confronted with the gospel. You hear the gospel. You obey it. You're baptized into Christ. Can you keep all of that stuff that you stole? Well, with this line of argumentation, you can, because you became a Christian. Therefore, you can keep all of that stuff. You were washed and justified and sanctified, and so whatever you stole before you became a Christian is now no longer stolen property because you became a Christian. Is that really how that works? Is that a position that we are willing to take? The sad fact is, yes, there are some people who are willing to take that position. Why are they willing to take that position? 
because it's more difficult to say that is a sinful relationship and you cannot stay there. If you're going to say that you've repented, then there must be some change. And that change is you can't keep what you took that's not yours in the first place. Yeah, that people want to justify their relationship because they are relatives, and that's key. Like, And I said that earlier in this video. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen that. Preachers, big-name preachers in the church, will change their position on divorce and remarriage because their daughter or their son or themselves, they themselves will get into a relationship that they have no business being in, and now, well, I have a different view on divorce and remarriage. Well, that's pretty convenient. So let's do this real quick. If it is the case, all right, so one of the things that I said was, um, well, why is, it only, why is it only divorce and remarriage that people say, say something like this about? Well, it, it doesn't apply to you before you're a Christian, but once you become a Christian, it does, and you can stay in whatever relationship you find yourself in. Let's try that with some other principles that Jesus taught, Okay. This is before the church is established, all right? Jesus is still on earth. His will is not yet in effect. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. If not, take one or two with you, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. Tell it to, a, tell it to the group, to the community. The church is not established yet. If he refuses to hear them, let him be unto you like a heathen and a tax collector. Well, that was before the church. Non-Christians don't have to do that. But they, they have to do that once they become Christians. Um, what about, and by the way, Jesus was, <laughs> when Jesus taught that, I'm going over to Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus taught that, good morning, Melissa, there were no Christians. That's the point. And yet it's still his law. The church was not yet established. And yet they were still subject to his law. What about this one? Therefore, whatsoever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Well, you don't have to do that when you're not a Christian. You're not subject to the laws of God until you become a Christian. Um, so you don't have to follow the golden rule. We could do this with everything that Jesus said. I tell you what, we could go to verses 13 and 14 where Jesus commands that you enter in by the narrow gate. Well, you're not a Christian. That doesn't apply to you yet. I mean, let's walk through the Gospels and do this with everything that Jesus said. But it's only discussed, for whatever reason, in the realm of divorce and remarriage. So here are some points I want you to think about. I wrote these down so I would say them accurately. Number one, nothing Jesus said when he was on earth was said in the church age. So why is Matthew 19 singled out? Jesus was a Jewish man who lived under the, under the jurisdiction of the law of Moses, Galatians 4.4. 4. So nothing he said was when the church was established. And so therefore from this position, no Christian has to do anything he says. Or, or no non-Christian has to do anything he says. Number two. The, God's marriage law goes back to Genesis chapter 2. And that is, to me, um, this is the most, this is the strongest point. So there are two questions that go on here in Matthew 19. Question number one, can you divorce for any reason? Um, answer number one, no. You cannot. What God has joined together, let not man separate. Well, that implies that man can separate it. But Jesus' command is, don't do that. But what is, so how does he justify that position? Because he who made them at the beginning made them male and female. Jesus, what Jesus is teaching here goes all the way back to the garden. God's marriage law is universal and eternal. Eternal in the sense of it began in the beginning when, when God made a, a helper suitable for Adam. And it doesn't end. All right, so question number one, can you divorce for just any reason? Answer number one, no. Question number two, well, why did Moses command you to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? Well, because of the hardness of your hearts, that was permitted. Okay? So there was a problem with humans. Again, this is pre-Christian, pre-church, but notice this. From the beginning, it was not so. In both of Jesus' answers here, 
um, to the first question and the second question, he goes back to the beginning. He goes back to the original marriage law. There is no divorce. But what he does do is permit one exception. If you divorce your wife except for fornication, King, New King James says sexual immorality, if your spouse is out having sex with someone else, that's, that's fornica- they're fornicating and they're adulterers. But if you divorce your spouse for any reason other than that and marry someone else, you're committing adultery. The, the text here is not hard to understand. Jesus' language is not difficult to pick up. All right, And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So it's not just the two that are originally involved. It could be a third party who's brought in and who's married or who marries the one that's been divorced. This, this language is so clear that the disciples say, well, maybe we shouldn't marry. If it's going to be so strict, then maybe we shouldn't marry. Well, no, it's strict. God's marriage law is strict. It's from the beginning. It's Mark 10, 6. It's from the beginning of creation. But it, the, the, God, God's law on marriage was not put into place so people would avoid marriage. <clears throat> marriage is a good thing. Marriage is God-ordained. But it's serious business. And you don't mess around with it. Let's say it that way. So um, nothing Jesus said was said in the church age. So why is Matthew 19 singled out as not applying in that way? Number two, the marriage law goes back to Genesis 2. Number three, where is the separate law for non-Christians? Well, the argument is there is none. And I was talking to this guy the other day, and he said, his words were, well, a non-Christian can divorce and remarry as many times as they want to. Uh, no. Well, I mean, they can, technically. <laughs> but with God's approval? Again, if Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, if he has authority over all flesh... John 17, 2. And if all people are going to be judged by his words, Acts 17, 30, and 31, and they are, why is it that only divorce and remarriage is singled out as saying, well, that doesn't apply to non-Christians, that only applies to Christians? That's Matthew 19 is just a covenant passage. Um, if you can't see through that, the, um, the, deliberate, the deliberate ignoring... Um, the deliberate circumventing of Matthew 19, then you, you might need somebody to help you get home if you cannot see how deliberate that twisting is. So where is the separate law for non-Christians? Well, the argument is made. There isn't one. They're not, they're not subject to any of that until they become Christians. Okay. Final point I wrote down here. If, it's not apply, if, if, if Matthew 19 does not apply to non-Christians, then they can literally do anything in terms of marriage. And they could stay that way once they become Christians. If there's no marriage law for the non-Christian from God, then they could practice polygamy, and once they become Christians, they could stay that way. Polygamy is a sin just as much as adultery is sin. But we're told that you can stay that way once you become a Christian, if you're living in adultery. Well, then if that's true, then this is true. That's what I was saying earlier. You don't just have to understand what you're saying. You have to understand the implications of what you're saying. If there is no law for the non-Christian on marriage, and then that non-Christian becomes a Christian and they can stay in the state where they were, then polygamy works out. If not, why not? Uh, Another comment here. If you are single and thinking of marrying someone who has been married, you better find out what, uh, why they divorced. Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to tell you what, again, and I'll go back to Matthew 19.10. It is so strict. God's law on marriage is so strict that this was the disciples' initial reaction. You better do your due diligence and, uh, and find out what's going on. This is not up for grabs. Jesus is teaching here, like I said, the text is not difficult to understand. Now, the scenarios that may play out in real life with different individuals, the, that's where the complexities come in and, and the justifications and 
the saying things like, well, Matthew 19, 9 doesn't apply to non-Christians. That's where all that comes in. That's when it gets uh, difficult and complicated. But I mean, th this text is, it's one of those that, as we say sometimes, it says, it, it means what it says. If you divorce your spouse for any reason other than them committing fornication and you get married again, you're living in adultery. And, and by the way, I haven't even, haven't even touched on this yet. And this ends the discussion right here. So to whom is Jesus speaking in Matthew 19? Well, he's speaking to the Pharisees who have these two questions. And he answers the two questions. But in his answer, he then says this, Whoever divorces his wife. Jesus does not mitigate. He doesn't qualify the whoever. He says, whoever does this. If you divorce your spouse, whoever, for some reason other than fornication, and you remarry, you're, you're committing adultery. And, and by the way, this, this committing adultery, and this commits adultery, or committeth, if you're looking at a King James Version, these are present tense verbs. Present middle. Present tense, middle voice. It's a present reality. This is what you are doing. There, there's another position out there that says it's not possible to live in adultery. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that, that's just not, um, that, that's not grammatically correct, and it's not scripturally, scripturally correct. Again, I think this particular issue is, it, I, I think one of the reasons that, there's, that so many people struggle with the issue of divorce and remarriage is because, that, because it is so widespread. So many individuals, families, congregations are affected by this. The easiest thing to do is, well, listen, you just come to Jesus, everything will be all right. You can stay where you are. Doesn't matter how many times you've been divorced or remarried. You become a Christian and just stay where you are and, um, and you'll be good to go. I mean, Matthew 19, 9 doesn't apply to you. And now, it does once you become a Christian. Do you, do you see how convenient that is? I'll show you another verse here. Um, and, and, of course, the charge will be, I'm showing you all these verses, and the charge will be, yeah, you're just proof texting. You're looking at verses. You're not regarding context. Well, this particular context is talking about a lot of different things. Let brotherly love continue. Be hospitable. Entertain strangers. Okay? Remember those who are prisoners. He's talking about a lot of different things that Christians have responsibility to do. Here's one of them. Marriage is honorable among all. Some versions read, Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Now notice that language. Fornicators, those who are practicing fornication. Adulterers, those who are adulterating. If you cannot live in adultery, this verse makes no sense. But some people hold that position in an effort to get out of difficult positions. And in an effort to tell people, listen, you just come to Jesus and your adultery will be done away with. Re remember what repentance is. You've got to repent, Acts 26, 20. Turn to God and do works that display that repentance. So if you're a thief, that would include giving back all the stuff you stole. That would include restoration of property that is not yours. And um, when it comes to marriage, the same thing is true. Jesus' teaching was done before the church was established. All of his teaching, not just this particular subject. So if you're going to single out one, I, I, okay, here's, well, we're in the neighborhood. I'll just flip over here to James chapter 2, all right? You're going to single out one thing. James chapter 2 and verse 10. Whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. You don't get to pick and choose which laws you want to follow and which laws you don't. All authority has been given to Jesus in heaven and on earth. He has authority over all flesh. All men are going to be judged by him. Marriage is to be held in honor by all. God's marriage law goes back to from the beginning of creation. Again, I think Mark 10, 6 is a key passage in understanding this particular topic or question. If you're going to keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Apply that to this particular conversation. Um, 
Yeah, Deborah says most will soften their view or change it altogether if a family member is doing it. And it's not just this particular subject. Um, I would say this is the primary one. But it's, it's interesting to watch people who are willing to compromise once held beliefs because a family member got involved in something that they shouldn't have. Now their view is different. Now they've restudied it, they've reconsidered. Well, when were you wrong? Were you wrong then or were you wrong now? And why did you change your view? What motivated you to go back and change your view? Something to think about. Matthew 19 is not a covenant passage. Jesus' marriage law applies to all people equally. It's whoever does this. You're not going to find an out that way. Um, repentance is a change of mind that causes you to turn to God and do works that are befitting of repentance. Acts 26, 20. Um, is it, I was thinking of another verse that said that. I believe, I believe I'm right. Matthew chapter 3. This is, of course, John the Baptizer's work here. Yeah, Matthew 3, 8. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Okay, so John's message was what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what he goes about preaching. All right? Well, what does that look like? Well, you have to bear fruits that are indicative of that repentance that shows that you actually have changed your mind. The book of Jonah does that very well, too, with, um, with the Ninevites. It illustrates for us perfectly what it looks like to repent. So Jonah goes and preaches, uh, yet 40 days in Nineveh shall be destroyed. And so the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast. They turned to mourning. Uh, the king tells them to do this. Uh, you keep reading here. All right, Jonah 3.10. Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. All right, so they repented and they did something about it. And that same thing, that same principle is true when it comes to divorce and remarriage. A non-Christian can live in adultery just like a Christian can because it's the same law for all people. You don't get to circumvent Matthew 19 because you're a non-believer. And, and preachers who preach that are absolutely twisting Scripture. And they're sending people to hell, comforting them in their sin. Oh, you don't have to, you can repent, but you, can, you don't have to change anything about your relationship. Well, then they didn't repent. Period. The works have to be visible. They have to turn from their sin. You can't stay in it. You can't, and that's the thing. You, if you're going to repent, you can't stay in sin because if you stay in sin, you haven't repented. You've not changed your mind. I'll just stay where I'm at and it'll work out. God, you know, God loves me. God, and I, I love this one. This is so good. God just wants me to be happy. Um, does God want people to be happy? Well, I would say happiness is, is not God's primary concern. Um, we're not, you know, we're not reading the Bill of Rights in the Constitution here. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's to fear God and keep His commandments. That's the whole of man. But we have turned it into, well, God's a God of love and God wants me to be happy. Well, good luck with all that. Because if you're going to do it for one thing, like divorce, you've got to do, you've got to do it for all things. God doesn't care if you're happy. He cares if you're saved, Deborah says. Absolutely right. Yeah, well, okay. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should be happy. I don't think that's what John 3.16 says. But that's the way a lot of people portray, portray becoming a Christian. That's what I've got for today, guys. Is Matthew 19.9 for Christians only? No. Matthew 19.9 is for whoever. And you can't limit that. It just, it's not how that works, grammatically or doctrinally. All right, so this is the only stream I'm doing this week. We'll be off next week as well. I, the only reason I did this one today is because it's another question that came up as a follow-up for a previous video that I had done. So I hope this has helped you. If you have further questions, send them to me. Uh, put them in the comment section here. Of course, all this stuff is uploaded on our YouTube, ch uh, YouTube channel, Mammoth Spring Church of Christ. So you can comment there too. All right, guys, I hope you have a good day. Hope you have a good couple of weeks. And hope to see you back here, I don't know, sometime in July. Have a good day.